Hi Space Cats, I'm Dr Maggie Liu, welcome back to my channel. The ultimate question, is there any life out there? Mankind has been forever searching for extraterrestrial life, but what exactly are we searching for? In this video, I'll be talking about the building blocks of life, so let's begin. To understand what signatures we should be looking for as a sign of life in space, we must first ask how did life here on Earth start? In 1952, Stanley Miller, a PhD student in physics at the University of Chicago, faced a big dilemma. His supervisor was leaving the university and he was getting nowhere with his research project on the synthesis of elements. Whilst at the university, he attended a lecture by Nobel laureate Harold Urey on the origin of solar system and prebiotic synthesis. This is the possibility of the synthesis of organic compounds such as carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids that are the basis for the molecules of life, and if they could be possible in the Earth's primitive atmosphere. This lecture inspired him to approach Yuri to take him on a new area of research. Together, Yuri and Miller designed an experiment, the Miller-Yuri experiment. So the purpose of the experiment was to simulate the initial conditions on Earth. They put simple inorganic compounds, water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen inside of a sealed system. And this system was then subjected to heat like it would experience through the sun and also electric shocks that it would experience through say atmospheric lightning. The energy from these processes, from the heating and from the electric shocks, induced a chemical reaction and within a week Miller detected the formation of various types of amino acids, sugars, fats and also other organic molecules. Amino acids in particular are said to be the building blocks of life itself because they string together to form proteins and we know that proteins carry out most chemical processes in cellular life. Miller found five different kinds of amino acids in his experiment, but after his death, examination of his original equipment revealed that over 20 different kinds of amino acids actually existed there. Scientists now think that the atmosphere of the early Earth is quite different to the environment that was originally in the Miller and Urey experiment that it was not so rich in ammonia and methane. However, a variety of consequent experiments with the correct ratios showed that the building blocks of life could still be formed spontaneously from these simple compounds. And it was quite robust to a very wide range of initial conditions. This means that the detection of water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen are key indicators for the potential for formation of life. But we can do more than just search for exoplanets with these types of molecules. As in the experiment, we know that to create life on Earth, we need an energy source. This energy source is not only the means for starting chemical reactions, but it's also necessary for the existence of liquid water. Our star, the Sun, is the main energy source in the solar system, and the amount that we can obtain from it depends on its distance. The further away you are from a star, the cooler you'll feel. And if you're a bit too far out, water will be frozen. If you're a bit too close in, the water will evaporate. The Goldilocks zone, sometimes known as the habitable zone, is the range of distances where the temperature is just about right for liquid water to remain on the surface of a planet. These range of distances, however, is not so easy to figure out because it actually depends on more than the temperature of the star. For a hot star, the Goldilocks zone will be further out than for a, say, colder star. But it also depends on the planet itself. Planets have what we call an albedo. This is a measure of a planet's reflectivity. The higher the albedo, the more reflective it is and the less heat it will be able to retain. 
The size of a planet plays an important role too as it determines a planet's internal heat. The larger a planet is, the slower it will be to cool. Planets or moons that are more than 50% the mass of the Earth are still hot and molten inside today, whereas those that have less than 50% the mass of the Earth, like Mercury, have solidified cores. Not only does the internal heat affect the temperature, but it drives convection and hence plate tectonics within a planet. So plate tectonics play a role in the carbon cycle. That's critical for regulating global temperature. Convection combined with a planet's spin is what generates a planet's magnetic field and that can protect any life from harmful effects from any star's radiation. So the Earth's magnetic field protects us from the harmful radiation of the sun and its UV rays. Now lastly, the mass of a planet affects its ability to host an atmosphere. If a planet is too light, its gravity won't be strong enough to retain an atmosphere. But then if it's too heavy, its atmosphere will be mostly hydrogen and helium because it would have had to form in the early stellar system when only those kind of elements were around. These planets would be too hot and have too high pressures to sustain life as we know here on Earth. So there you have it. If you're looking for life on an extra solar planet, then make sure you look for planets with signs of water, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen. Look for planets that live within a Goldilocks zone, but this depends on both the planet and the star it orbits around. And make sure the planet has properties like mass and size that will allow it to sustain life. Thank you so much for watching this week's video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.